are the lion and the lamb, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. We know that you will reign forever, and you've invited us to join that party with you. We can't wait.
turn from the sin that drags us down, and we can come forward and live with you in harmony and peace. We thank you for your spirit, your grace, and your love that turns us that we can stand by your side as sons and daughters. Amen. Morning. It's good to be with you today. And so good, glad that you decided to brave the winter snow and make your way to church this morning. And I hope that uh, you come uh, expecting a blessing and have been blessed already by the music uh, this morning. And um, real quick, just uh, something I wanted to mention today. I don't know how many of you have been keeping track of what's been going on in our government and some of the um, things and bills that have been passed and uh, been trying to get passed. And I would say just to remind you today that today is actually uh, Sanctity of Life Day. Um, the House of Representatives have recently, at the federal level, uh, they have uh, passed the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. And if you're not familiar with what that is, that means any abortion that um, a baby actually survived uh, the attempt at abortion, then they must be given medical attention. And I praise God for the House of Representatives, this bill now has to go on to the Senate, and so um, we just need to be in a lot of prayer over that, uh, over that issue, and continue to be in prayer for these innocent lives out there, um, just so much to be thankful for, and so much to pray for still, and so I would encourage you to do that. Um, we are in part two of our series on the seven churches of Asia Minor that we read about in the book of Revelation. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke on the need to see ourselves as we truly are when we are apart from Jesus, and we read about the description that John gives from his vision of, um, of Jesus and, and what Jesus looked like in chapter 1 when he described what Jesus was wearing, and, and he talks about his white hair and his eyes like flaming fire and feet like burning bronze, his voice being like the sound of many waters. And, you know, the book of Revelation is about Jesus being revealed to us as the righteous king and the judge of all mankind. And uh, the message, uh, the messages that we read about from Jesus to the seven churches, it's a message that is not only for them then, but it's also for the church today as well. And, and what do we find with the first letter to the first church of Ephesus? Uh, well, let me just start by sharing a, a quick story and then maybe some background. Uh, there was an older couple riding down the road together in an old classic car. It had the, you know, it had the, the kids won't understand this, but the old A and FM stereo. Um, it had the manual windows and no power steering, no power brakes. Uh, it had that full-size vinyl bench seat. You remember those in the front? And that way your, 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 your love could sneak up next to you and you could put your arm around her while you're driving, that kind of thing. And they were, did I hear an amen? <laughs> they were going on their usual Sunday afternoon drive after picking up some uh, ice cream, getting an ice cream cone, when the wife looks over at the husband and she says, you know, when we first got married, you'd talk to me and, and tell me about your dreams and You'd stop and you'd pick up flowers for me and you'd have your arm around me and pulling me close as we drove down the road. And she said, now look at us. I'm all the way over here and you're all the way over there. What's happened to us, she said. And the old guy, he was driving, he just kept driving silently for a few minutes and then he finally spoke up and he said, you know, it's kind of funny. I'm still sitting in the same spot. <laughs> Amen again. If you don't feel close to the Lord today, it's not because He has moved. He's still
still sit in the same spot. We're the ones that decide not to sit closer to him. Some, some background maybe will help us set the stage for the first letter that we read about John. And I kind of mentioned a little bit about this a couple weeks ago. He's the last of the original 12 disciples, an older man now. He's living in the city and uh, he's pastoring the church of Ephesus. Domitian is the emperor of the Roman Empire in that area, and he was the first emperor of Rome that really started to demand people worship him as a god. And here in Ephesus, <clears throat> Domitian has this huge temple built and dedicated to himself. This is a depiction of what the temple would have looked like based upon the ruins that are still up today. It consisted of two gymnasiums that were used for study and philosophical teaching and debates and discussion. And what's interesting is that in each floor of this temple had these, you can see the columns in there. And then at the top of the platform, there was a temple to worship Dominion's huge statue of himself. But what's interesting is that the columns that held up the structure each had these you can kind of see them in the middle there. Each had these heads of the different Greek gods that people worshipped during that time. And so Domitian's statue was literally being held up by the Greek gods. And he was basically above all of them. His statue was estimated to be about 70, or I'm sorry, 27 feet, feet tall. And it was positioned so that if you were coming to the area, whether on land or by water... Uh, you would see this humongous statue of Dominion. It was, like, it was almost like he was saying, I'm not just king of kings, but I'm God of gods. I want everybody to see. But he wasn't the only God being worshipped in Ephesus. There's also Artemis and the other Greek gods, but Ephesus was the center of, uh, for Dominion worship. After all, he was still alive. And so maybe there was a personal connection with people. But uh, so, so what we have and what we would have seen during that time, walking down the streets of the city of Ephesus were these little small altars for him where the people would stop and they would actually kneel at these altars and they would acknowledge Dominion as God. In fact, this was enforced. And, and if you refuse to do that, then, then you could be punished. And this is... I say all that so that you and I understand this is the city that the church of Ephesus was located in. This is, this is where they're at. This was, this was the church that the Apostle John actually pastored at one time. And, and of course, as I mentioned last time, John was exiled to the island of Patmos because of his faith in the one true God and obviously not being Dominion. They tried to kill him. It didn't work. So they exiled him to the island of Patmos. Now, Today, friends, we live at a time that reminds me of John chapter 3, verse 20. For everyone that doth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. What's that? Well, basically, if you, if you love the world, then guess what? You'll probably end up despising the truth of Jesus Christ. I mean, isn't that what the world today is all about? In our postmodern era, the dismissal of absolute truth, right? Um, people are having a problem accepting just simple truths. And this is how people in a, a place like California can try and pass a law that legalizes infanticide. That is the killing of a baby up to 27 days after it's been born. It's how people can try to legalize sexual immorality and criminalize anybody that disagrees. There's a growing hostility toward truth. And we're witnessing a generation of people that are growing up and actually committing themselves to increasingly doing things that are evil. And so what's even more concerning is how the church is just kind of willingly walking away from the truth and tolerating 
what we should be calling modern paganism. And so in America, listen, we, we've always lived under the freedoms that our Constitution spells out, which includes religious freedoms, right? I mean, it's spelled out for us. It included religious freedoms. And in the United States for now, it's still legal to be a Christian. But, listen, what happens, what happens when we, the church, lose our love for the truth of God? What happens? What is going to happen when we compromise our faith just so that we can be liked or just so that we can remain comfortable? Remember in, in chapter 1, verse 20, where Jesus talks about the seven golden candlesticks, which were the seven different churches. And Jesus, it, it describes how Jesus was walking among, among the churches, if you will. And, and this, is, this is Jesus knowing and caring about um, what they, the church was going through, what they're dealing with. And he knows the good things about them, but he also knows their failures, and Jesus knows what's going on in his church today as, as well, doesn't he? he? He knows what's going on with his people here at River of Life, Christian Church. He knows the good things about us, and he knows our failures as well. Jesus knows. And uh, the thing is, is that he's walking among his churches today. He has told the church all over the world, you are to share the message of my son, Jesus Christ, with the lost and dying world. And Jesus is walking amongst us, uh, not only because he cares, but it's because he takes the business of his church a lot more serious than the church does. That you and I are to take his message of hope and life into a lost and dying world. He absolutely wants us to take his church seriously. Why? Because it's the hope of the world today. We live in the church age. And Jesus has given us the responsibility, pass the mantle, the torch, to his church to carry on his, miss his mission. So you better believe that he takes this seriously. This is why Jesus wrote these letters to the seven churches, to encourage them. To encourage them to remember, encourage them to repent, and encourage them to return and come back to him, to right the ship, if you will. These are seven real churches in Asia Minor. Um, I, I, I read them last week, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And the message wasn't just meant for them, it's also meant for us today. And I wonder if Jesus were to write a letter to the church today. If he were to write a letter to River of Life Christian Church today, what would it say? The greatest need for the church today isn't programs. The greatest need for the church today is not buildings, and it's not planning the daylights out of every single aspect of the life of the church or ourselves. The greatest need for the church today is to be faithful to Jesus Christ and how we live our lives with the time that he has given us to be here on this earth. And the letters that Jesus had sent to the churches follow a very similar format. He praises them, and then he points out areas for repentance. He warns them of his judgment, and then he promises blessings for those who actually overcome in his name. And each church is in a unique situation. Everyone, much like churches are, are so different today with, with their own strengths and their own weaknesses. And listen, we have strengths. We've got plenty of weaknesses. Uh, you're not going to find a perfect church. And I always joke and say, if you leave here and you go find a perfect church, don't go to it because it won't be perfect anymore. So there is no such thing as a perfect church. We have our own strengths. We've got our own weaknesses. Each letter addressing this, these seven churches, uh, but Jesus is speaking to all of the churches. And I'll tell you something else. Each church being attacked by Satan with different strategies. Trying to find the weakness, the weak spot in the armor. And so the first letters to the church of Ephesus, and, and I would just, you could basically call the city of Ephesus, the city itself, you could call it a hot mess. It was the central port 
for Asia Minor with this large harbor. Okay, picture this. There's a harbor coming into the city. It was actually, the city of Ephesus was known as the Light of Asia. Do you know that? The Light of Asia. And because of that harbor, it was a central trading hub for Asia and the four main trade routes that ran in and out of the city. Um, it was also known for its paganism, for its idolatry. It was known for that. We have the temple to Domitian. We also have a temple to Artemis, which also served as the central bank of the Mediterranean. Historians, this is what historians say, and I quote, that there were scores of eunuchs, thousands of priestesses, prostitutes, singers, and dancers. The worship was a kind of hysteria, debauchery, drunkenness, sexual deviations, frenzies of shameless mutilation. That's what the historians say about the city of Ephesus. And right in the middle of that city of sin and idolatry is a group of Christians proclaiming the gospel. So Jesus says a few things. Of course, we're going to follow the pattern for Ephesus. Jesus, what does he first do? He first points out the good things about the church in Ephesus. And he starts by commending them here in verses 2 to 3. Take a look at what it says here. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. I want you to think about that now. This is a church. Now remember, early on in its ministry, they started a riot by preaching Jesus. Could we do that? Could we just start a riot in Clarkston, Independence Township? That would be great. I would love that. That'd be amazing. They started a riot. I mean, they were, they were on fire. Obviously, they were active. They were interested in Jesus. They were interested in being faithful to him. They were not interested in being comfort, uh, comfortable. They weren't interested in entertainment. Uh, they were laboring for the faith in a city that was absolutely full of wickedness. And that, my friends, takes spiritual maturity. It takes spiritual maturity. It takes perseverance to do this. This church should be commended for those things. And that's what Jesus does. He commends them for it. He says to them, I know your works. I know your patient endurance. I, I can see how you're, you can't stand with those who are evil. And, and I see how you've tested those who claim to be apostles. You've tested them. You found out that they weren't. And you, you found out that they were false. I know that you are enduring patiently. And I know that you're keeping the faith for my name's sake. You haven't grown weary. You see, if, if you read the resume of the, of the Ephesus church, you would read, you would read hardworking, diligent, persevering amidst the difficulty, devoted to doctrine, and one who hates and is resistant to sin. That's a good resume. I mean, Jesus says, I know, I, I see these things about you guys. These are all good. Well, listen, understand something. The church in Ephesus was now, they were a second-generation church. Okay, a second-generation church. For 40 years, they labored in the faith. For 40 years. You, you don't think that, that, times, that times in their lives, they, as a church, they wanted to give up? Of course they probably felt that way sometimes. You think they ever had their fair share of failures? Do you think that maybe they had people betray them and betray the faith? No doubt some experienced discouragement. No doubt about it. And I can tell you, people were watching. People were observing them from the outside and the inside of the church. But I want you to know today, church, I, I need you to listen. Jesus knows the good things that are done in his name. He knows about them. And yes, it can be discouraging when it doesn't seem to be noticed. Or we can't always see the tangible results. The truth is... Ministry is difficult, and it can be discouraging. Believe me, trust me, it is difficult, and it can be discouraging. You know why? Because war 
Because war are those things. And you and I, as Christians, you know what we're in? We're in a spiritual war. We're fighting a spiritual battle. We're fighting against spiritual, cultural, all sorts of battles as Christians in this life. And what Jesus commends them for is their patient endurance. Their patient endurance. I mean, how many of you know that living for God requires just that? Patient endurance. Sometimes it's good to be reminded in our lives that the early church did. Sometimes it's good for us to be reminded, you know what, we feel like giving up because we struggle with things, and guess what, the same problems in our lives, the early church dealt with. It causes us to look forward to the day when Jesus returns and finally ends the battle, amen? Can't wait for that. But in the meantime, what does Jesus do? He commends them who endure. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. It says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Hebrews 12 and 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Run with what? Patience. Patient endurance. There's something else that Jesus pointed out to the church that he saw as a good thing. They were willing to test and reject false teachers. They were not tolerant of the false teaching and the sin. They weren't tolerant of it. You know why? I think it's because they understood the damage that sin and false teaching does to the fellowship and to the testimony of the church. Do you take the church of Jesus seriously? Because when we do, then we will see the false teaching, and we will see the sin, and we wouldn't be about that. The Apostle Paul also wrote to the, Corinthians, or the Christians in Ephesus in, in, the, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 27, when he told them, he said, I don't want you guys to give any place at all to the devil. Give no place to the devil. Don't give him a foothold in the life of the church. They wanted nothing to do with Satan or his lies or his plans to divide the church. And I'll tell you something right now. Evil people find their way into congregations. And if we're not careful, they will divide the church. And it appears that the Ephesians took this seriously and carefully vetted their teachers and vetted their leaders. I remember a time years ago, in the early part of uh, my ministry when I became a pastor, I remember there was a gentleman that started coming to a Sunday school class. He was an older gentleman, um, and he came to Sunday school, and he started to befriend everybody, and... I noticed one day that he was starting to hand out some little pamphlets and kind of like information. And, you know, on the outside, it, it looked pretty harmless. You know, it seemed like it was, it was okay. And, and um, the more he was around, he would attend, you know, our, our Sunday morning service as well, right after Sunday school. And um, my dad, who most of you know, very knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about the scriptures, and he had received one of these pamphlets, and he was going through it, and immediately his red flags were going up everywhere. And he came to me, and he said, you know, Larry, you know, so-and-so, you know who I'm, I'm talking about? Said, yeah, I know, the new, the new gentleman, and he seems really nice, but he said, you know, you know he's passing out material, um, and it's, it's Seventh-day Adventist material. And so I sat down and I had a meeting. I brought him, I talked to him in the office, and I started asking him some questions and come to find out he was using our church as his mission field. And he was trying to take people from our church congregation and convert them to the Seventh-day Adventist beliefs and get them to leave our church on Sundays and go and worship on Saturdays. And I sat down and I, I told him, I said, you know, you're more than welcome to worship with us. 
but I need you to respect us and respect our beliefs. So you can be here, but I can't allow you to pass things out. And um, but I, 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 of course, I want him to be there because I wanted him, him to uh, to no longer, you know, I want to convert him. So, <laughs> um, but that's one of those things. You see, they it's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Sometimes they they seem great, they seem nice, but in reality, there's a different motive. There's false teachers. They're out there, my friends, and we have to be careful. The church of Ephesus was just that. They, they didn't tolerate false teaching. They tested them to make sure and didn't tolerate it. Take a look at verse 6. Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. But this thou hast... <coughs> That thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Those are strong words from Jesus. He hates, he hates the Nicolaitans. And, and this isn't the only place that the Nicolaitans are mentioned here. Um, now, we don't know a lot about this group of people, the Nicolaitans, um, except that they were some sort of a, a cult that indulged in extreme sensuality, is how some commentaries would, would say. Clement of Alexandria said this about them. They abandoned themselves to pleasure like goats, leading a life of self-indulgence. You know how goats, you put a, they just eat everything around them. They just go crazy, right? That's, that's how they were. There was no self-control. It was self-indulgence. That was the, the, the characteristic of the Nicolaitans. And the Christians in Ephesus rejected that false teaching and that lifestyle of, of serving self. And, and, and serving Jesus means having a relationship with Him first. And if you're trying to do good things without the relationship, it's just going to be dry. It'll be draining. And as we move from the commendation from Jesus to the church, we move to the, the correcting. This was really the basis for Jesus' correction in verse 4. If you take a look here, verse 4, it says... Nevertheless, he said, so all these good things, but nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. I've got this thing. What is it? Because you have left your first love. Now listen, you can have, you can have tremendous zeal for correct doctrine. You can be a hard worker. You can faithfully serve. And somehow still let your love for Jesus fade. And the result, my friends, is a lack of love for those around you. Jesus is reminding them that the great commandment matters. Remember that Jesus identified himself to the Ephesian church as the one walking among the seven golden candlesticks. It seems like a reminder to the church that we bear his light as a church, that we are light from God, shining in dark places, places like Ephesus. And it's impossible to do that if we're not in a right relationship with Jesus. If we don't have a love for God and a love for others, as the great commandment says, what does the great commandment say? Love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says, the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. I'm reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2, where it says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, love, I am nothing. What about you today? That fire that you once had burning in your heart for Jesus. Do you wonder where it's gone? Church, it always starts with a relationship with the Lord. If serving the Lord in the church or outside of the church has become this dry burden then I would say Jesus isn't the one that moved. I think you need to look at your relationship with the Lord. 
You know, I've noticed over the years the, the most who find themselves in this spot will pull away from the church, pull away from the Lord's church. And I know the feeling of wanting to do that after being in ministry for so many years now. I have found myself with that feeling of, well, that maybe I should just, man, take my family, run off and hide and be like the rest of the normal church people. And just come to church and sit in the congregation and be fed and then go about my day and my week. My friends, that's not the answer. The answer is to slide over in the seat and get closer to the Lord. That's the answer. Have you abandoned your love for God? Have we as a church fallen into the trap of, of doing and doing and doing so much so that we forgot to be loving. You know, Warren Wearsby, he once said this. He said, labor is not a substitute for love. Neither is purity a substitute for passion. The church must have both if it's going to please him. Now, for those of you who haven't gone through our membership class here at the church, our, mem our, our mission statement, this is, this is our mission statement here at River of Life. A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. That's how we glorify God. By loving Him and by loving others. But it starts with a relationship with Him. I mean, is not the greatest threat to the American church isn't it itself? Isn't that really the great? Aren't we our greatest threat? And, oh, Pastor Larry, we have to do what's popular, though. We need to do what's entertaining. We need to do what's trendy, what gets the most shock value and attention, as if the presence and the power of God are no option. Churches can become more centered around their fellowship and around their gatherings than they are on loving God with all of their heart, soul, and strength. That's right. But you know, I've also, I've also heard Christians, you know, I've heard Christians blame their pastors and their teachers for essentially not bottle feeding them the scriptures every single week, giving them their, their weekly spiritual milk. And if they're not being fed, then, well, then it's not their fault. It's the church's fault. See, I've heard both extremes. The church is this, the church, is, the church doesn't have this, and I, I always think to myself, well, what are you doing for yourself? I mean, at home, during the week, you're, you're here once a week, but at home, during the week, what are you doing for yourself? I can preach from the, the pulpit and say, you need to go home and be in the Word, and be in prayer, and study. You need to not just read the Word, but study the Word so that you can grow. I can say that till I'm blue in the face, or red in the face, but if you don't do it, and then the church comes back, and they experience the effects or ill effects of not following through with those things, and then turn around and blame the church for it? Really? It starts with relationship. We need to take the church seriously. We need to take the relationship with Jesus personally and seriously. Have some personal responsibility. How deadly it can be for us to have strong, sound, biblical doctrine and have programs coming out of our ears but lack love for Jesus. And as a result, lack love for those around us. You ever heard a Christian say, I don't like people? problem with that. There's a problem with that. You ever wonder why some churches seem to drive people away? Well, it's right here at this point. It's right here at this point. Lack of love for Jesus results in a lack of love for others. If you have an ear to hear, please hear this. 
I'm speaking to our church right now. If you are in a leadership role and you are serving without love, if you are in a position of serving other people and doing so without love, if you are new and young in your faith and that initial zeal for the Lord is kind of starting to fade, if the time that you spend in the Word and prayer and worship has started to fade, if you are compromising in different areas of your life with a specific sin, then you're in danger. As your pastor, I'm trying to tell you, you're in danger of having lost your first love. And Jesus is calling his church, his bride, back to himself to fall in love with him again. For the church to right the ship and all of a sudden we look and we go, wow, this 2,000 year old letter to the church of Ephesus is so applicable to us today. Is Jesus your first love? Has that love shifted to someone or to something else? If it has, then Jesus has given us a prescription on what to do. He, he diagnosed the problem. And he actually gives us a prescription of what to do. What to do if I don't love others? What to do if my love is faded uh, for Christ? Recognize that the diagnosis is actually a lack of love. For Jesus, and so Jesus has John write to the church of Ephesus and to us today. And he says this in verse 5 of Revelation 2. And I've underlined the key words there. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Do you think that this is something that the church today should take seriously? I mean, Jesus has John write this, these three key words that give us the answer to our love problem. It's really not an obedience problem, it's a love problem. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. It's a love problem. He says, remember. This is the first thing that Jesus tells us to do. He says, remember. Do you remember... You guys remember what it was like when you first got married? <clears throat> Think about that. I, re I remember when I first got married to Bianca, my heart could burst. I would do anything for her. I mean, I'd still do anything for you. <laughs> 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 to a point. Come on, Ellen. <laughs> Try to give me a trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the gray. It's silver. Get wise. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I remember, you know, when we first got married, I would do, really, I would do, there wasn't anything I would do to earn her love. Really. I mean, I would do anything, and, and I would show her in some way. I was always trying to show her that I cared about her and loved her. When I was a teenager, I wasn't even 20 years old. I was working full-time, and, and she'd have car problems, and she was in school, and I'd, you know, fix her car for her, and I, I, mean, I would do anything I could. That was a, a first love. It's a passionate kind of love. It's a protecting love. It's an unconditional love. It's a fervent love. It's a sanctifying kind of love. Jesus says to sanctify. Men, sanctify your wives as Jesus sanctified the church. You know what that means? That means you need to see your wife for not who she is right now, but who, who, who she can be and will be when, when Jesus actually, when she is fully sanctified. When she is at her heavenly state, you need as a husband to look at her that way. Pass the laws. It's a kind of love that really consumes your life, isn't it? That's a first kind of love. This is what we're told to remember about Jesus, our Savior. Do you remember what it was like? You remember what it was that made you feel love for Jesus when you first got saved? 
And you would sell everything you owned. Remember that? You were like, it doesn't matter. Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do. You name it. And now we say, well... So we'll have my legs in the first It's, right. <laughs> it's being streamed in there, brother. I'm sorry. <laughs> Our relationship with Jesus needs to be the thing that occupies those high places in our lives, the priority places of our lives. We need to think about Jesus. We need to thank Jesus. We need to worship Him. He needs to occupy those places in our lives on a, a daily basis. Think about Him and what He has done for you because when we really truly think about what Jesus has done for us, Man, we start becoming that person again who would lay it all down, who would lay it all on the line to follow Him, who would be willing to pick up their cross every single day, self-sacrifice, pick that cross up, and follow Jesus every day. Die to self every day in order to follow Him. Isn't that what Jesus said? If you're going to follow me, then you need to pick up your cross daily and follow me. The second key word that Jesus tells us to do is to repent. What is that? We turn away, don't we? We turn away from the things that keep us away from Jesus. What does it say? Let's say what it says in Matthew chapter 5. Is that right? Yes, Matthew chapter 5, 29 to 30. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. What is it that keeps you from Bible study? What is it that keeps you from spending time in prayer? What is it that keeps you from being reliant on Jesus? What is it that keeps you from repenting and turning away and surrendering your life, everything, of you, everything of who you are, surrendering that to the Lord. What is it that is standing in the way? Because your soul depends upon your willingness to repent of those things so that you can live a life of loving Jesus and loving others. What is it that is standing in the way? Then pluck it out. And then lastly, he says, to do the first works. Now, if you have found that you, maybe you've found that you're, you're in this spot where you feel like you have lost your first love, Jesus. He says, he says, do the first works. You need to go back. You need to go back to the cross. You need to go back there and you need to seek forgiveness from Him. You need to go back and do the first things, not because you must, but because you want to. Nothing is more satisfying than knowing God and following Jesus, my friends. Absolutely nothing in this life. You can do away with all of the things that we have in this life. As long as you have Jesus, you have enough. When? When in your life did God all of a sudden not be enough? What is it? What is that thing or that person where all of a sudden he wasn't enough for you? Think about that. Revelation 2 and 7. He says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We will also close with the closing portion of Jesus' letter to the church of Ephesus. <coughs> this closing, this closing here is full of hope. It's full of hope. He uses the word overcometh. Overcometh. To be an overcomer in Jesus is 
is to confess your sin. That's how we become overcomers. It is to confess the sin. It is to seek forgiveness through Him. To be an overcomer is to, is to hold on to the gospel and the Bible as the foundation of our faith. That's how we overcome. And Jesus promises, He says, the overcomers that they will eat. Think about this. Eat from the tree of life. This is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. The problem, you can't tell me you never wondered what tree of life tasted. It's going to be amazing, right? The tree, the tree of life we're talking about here, this, this is the promise to the overcomer here, is heaven. It's eternal life. Is this saying that, that uh, there, were, uh, there were people in the church of Ephesus who, who actually failed to repent and never saw heaven? Could be. Yeah, could be. So don't do that. Don't do that. Don't find out. Stay victorious in the faith. And the promise, my friends, will be heaven. I close with 1 John 5, 4 to 5, where it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's how we're overcome. It's through a relationship with Jesus. Why don't you bow with me? As the worship team comes forward and we just prepare for a, a time of reflection, I just want to encourage you today to do business with God if you need to. Not to leave this place if there's some things that you need to handle between you and him, I just really encourage you to do that. Father, we thank you so much for our time this morning. We praise you, Father, for your word and specifically the, the letters that you sent to the churches so many years ago that really are still for us today. Those seven churches represent your church today. We thank you for the message. And Father, we ask and pray that you would help us today, that if we find ourselves in a place where we have lost our love for your Son, we find our faith faded, our time with Him, our, our study time, our personal time, quiet time with, with you. Father, if we have found that to be not what we want it to be or what we know it should be. I just ask and pray that you would help us to take that prescription you've given us to remember, to repent, and then to return and go back and do what we know we should be doing. And that is kneeling at the cross of your son and asking for forgiveness. I pray that we would do that today as a church. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if there are those of you here today that have been dealing with the topic of what we've preached on this morning, what we've touched on this morning, maybe you've been dealing with some of this and you feel like you've just kind of lost your, your first love. You, you desire to get back to where you know God wants you to be in the right relationship with Him. If that's where you're at today, I just want you to be honest with God. He already knows, but He wants you to be honest with Him and have some personal responsibility and accountability to Him. Confess those things to Him. If you're here today and you said struggling, Pastor Larry, in this area, would you pray for me? I would love to pray for you today. If you want, just quickly, no one looking around. All you got to do is slip your hand up, put it back down. God bless you. God bless you.
of knowing that when your day ends here on this earth, that you have a home in heaven, that one day you'll be with him and like him, Jesus. If that's where you're at today, you too, just quickly raise your hand and put it back down and say, Pastor, will you pray for me? I want to know Jesus today. raise your hand this morning. I want you to say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I know that I've sinned against you. I know that I'm a sinner. I've been disobedient to you. But I believe that you sent your son, Jesus, to die for me. And so right now, I just ask that you would forgive me of my sin. All of my sins. Forgive me. And thank you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. I ask that as I repent right now, and I turn away from my old life, and I turn to you, the Father, you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to walk hand in hand with your Son, Jesus, by the power of your Spirit. If you said that prayer today, I just want to congratulate you on that. Just know that you're, you're saved. Know that if you meant that from your heart, that you have a home in heaven. And right now, today, from this day forward, God begins the process of making you more like his son. And that's something that we can thank him for. Father, today, those others of us that raise their hands today, they're maybe struggling with a faith or a love for, for your son that's faded. Father, I lift them up to you right now asking and praying that whatever it is that is in their life, whatever it is that is this barrier, this wall, roadblock, whatever, between them and you, something that has caused them to allow their faith or their love for you and your son to fade, I pray that you would help them to see that, recognize it, repent of it, pluck it out, get rid of it, and begin walking with you anew. We know that every day when we wake up, there's joy. There's joy in the morning when we have a relationship with you, a right relationship with you. And so, Father, I ask that on behalf of those that have raised their hands. I pray that you would just continue to work on them, continue to allow your Holy Spirit to work in their lives to make them more like your son, Jesus. We thank you and praise you, Father, for all that you do. And it's in Jesus' name we ask and pray. And all of God's people said... Amen. Watch us.
pray that you will wake us up and lift our eyes to you.